So I'm very excited to start the semester, but I'm even more excited to present Shahma. It's uh, always uh, super emotional to have a student finish, especially a student like Shahma. So I think Shahma had one of the most uh, like, kind of uh, ideal PhD. So the whole thing started like from projects, which led to another project, which led to even bigger projects. And it was uh, a really interesting and stimulating kind of uh, intellectual experience to go through it together over the past few years and, and see how things evolve and progress. And Shaka started with the bank, like he already came with data for almost two years of surveys, which was published really rapidly. He started as a direct PhD student. Um, he's the first and hopefully not last, but might be so, a uh, student from, from a college, from Ichmoret, to the uh, direct PhD. And from since, since then, he just went up and up and up. So the whole PhD has been a, uh, upward uh, progress. I think last year he published three papers, the last one just a few weeks ago in Nature Ecology kind of Evolution. So it's been a really successful. I don't know about PhD, but what's really important is again that it's, it's it was interesting. He kept his intellectual spirit, his, his interest in science, but also he, he took everything with a stride. You know, you get projections all the time, and you get uh, bad reviews, and, and everything was cool. Nothing was a big deal, right? So you get this huge three-page negative review. It just he just did it. He just fixed it, and he submitted it again. And things were accepted eventually. So like he just. The atmosphere was always nice, always pleasant uh, to work with Shaka. I think the only time my son get really angry is when he was falsely accused by the head of the marina in Tel Aviv that he left the gate open or something. <laughs> that, that, that's where his integrity, he just couldn't take it. So I had to send letters to the mayor and to, I don't know what, that, this is too much. <laughs> Apart from that, I think scientific, he just he took it with, with the scribes. And of course, at a personal level, it's been amazing uh, to work with, and you were just always so helpful with, to other people in the lab. So uh, helping with technical issues, rethinking the research questions, uh, helping with fish identification, anything that needed, you know, help. You were always there. He, he would work endless hours with new students to try to, to help them with their own stuff. And it was really amazing, uh, amazing uh, asset to the lab. Um, I think the major challenge I had with Shaka and his PhD was to convince him that maybe going and doing a postdoc in a small village in Portugal is not a good idea. That was my main challenge. I think I managed to succeed, I succeeded in pushing him to do a, a postdoc in a major European and North American university. Uh, I'm not sure I did. And I'm sure that in a few years I'm going to go to vacation in Greece, a small island, find him on the beach, drinking his coffee, and playing Sheshbesh, <laughs> probably submitting another high impact publication. <laughs> so I'll uh, let Shaka talk from here. So hi everybody, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, thank you everybody for coming, uh, I'm very excited. Um, so uh, today I'll present my PhD uh, titled Marine Species, Latitudinal and Depth Redistributions in the Face of Global Change. And I'll start with a, a brief introduction to what are species uh, uh, redistributions. So species redistributions are simply the change in the territory that species occupies. So for instance, we have here the distributions of those two different species in the first time period. And then after a while, from some reason, they redistribute. And you can see that every species is doing that in its own unique pattern. And indeed, species redistributions are coming in multiple patterns. Some species can expand their distributions while others contract it. And some can shift to regions that they've never been there before with no overlap with the previous uh, distribution, and others can do different variations of the such. And there are also numerous driver, drivers for why species are redistributing. One of them is uh, the most widely discussed in the last decades is climate change induced species redistributions in which we're seeing uh, many species moving towards cooler environments uh, to track climate. Other uh, option could be uh, exploitation, such as uh, fisheries that can remove individuals from one region and creating some sort of patterns of redistributions. And also another special case, which is invasive species that are usually expanding the range due to human activity. It's also some kind of species redistributions. So this is a worldwide phenomenon where evidence for species that are moving towards higher elevations, uh, is, such as in mountains regions, or moving towards higher latitudes. But we also know that species can uh, deepen uh, to cope with changing climate, although there is a bit less evidence for that. So I'd like to give an example of how warming coincides uh, with uh, rain shifts. So an example of species that track in climate. So there is a, a nice study by Pinsky et al. As you can see here, uh, he studied a 
marine organisms uh, around the U.S. Uh, continental shelves and also Canadian waters, so altogether 360 marine taxa. And on the y-axis, you can see the latitudinal shift in degrees uh, latitudes north per year, so it's the rate of how fast they are moving in positive values towards higher latitudes <laughs> and in negative towards uh, lower latitudes. Um, and on the x-axis, we can see the change in the bottom temperature. And now every dot that I'll show here on this plot will be a different assemblage. And this is what they found in this study. They found a positive association. So it means that increasing bottom temperature correlates with forward migrations. And we can also see here that there is an outlier here, and this is the Gulf of Mexico. And it prevents those forward movements because it has a semi-enclosed nature to the north. So individuals will encounter land if they'll move towards the north. If we remove this assemblage, then we get a significant positive association showing that species are tracking climate. And okay, I'll give a, I'll give a, a brief overview of uh, my uh, PhD chapters. Um, what I'll present today are, is a bunch of chapters about redistributions. And the first chapter will be about warming and depth redistributions across the Mediterranean Sea. So it's a macro scale study. In the second chapter, I zoom in towards the Israeli coasts, the Levantine Basin, and I'll focus on how depth changes are related with abundance changes. I try to understand what is the meaning of changing their depths. So if species that are deepening can preserve their abundances in the face of warming. And the third chapter is Again, I do a zoom out, it's on a macro scale, and it asks questions, it asks questions about our fast forward shifters are climatic winners. So I try to focus on the range shift velocities. Um, how does abundance changes relate with how fast you are? And this is what I'll present today. Um, I also have additional chapters for my PhD that includes field work that I won't talk uh, uh, today. Uh, one chapter is asking questions such, such as which species are more likely to expand their uh, range, which, uh, which species are more likely to be uh, invasive species, and also once those species invaded to the new environment, how will they um, facilitate those new niche uh, that they arrived in? Will they change their depth niche, their habitat preferences, their thermal niche? So these kinds of questions. And another chapter about invasive species is about the impacts of invasive species on the recipient community. And this is a specific case study on the silver cheek toadfish, Laginon Moarach, a, a puffer fish, um, which I will also not talk today. And the last chapter about uh, uh, breeding aggregations of uh, stingrays, of batoids and guitarfish, and, and which I surveyed uh, for three years uh, the temporal uh, abundance dynamics of those species in a uh, marine protected area. Okay, so let's begin with the first chapter titled Cold Water Species Deepen to Escape Warm Water Temperatures. Um, so I hope that I convinced some of you that we have evidence that species are indeed tracking climate. So what you can see here, uh, however, let's say that this population needs to track the climate and find its uh, preferred climate. Let's assume that it's uh, about the north side of uh, the UK. So in order for those po this population to find its uh, climatic optimum, it might need to migrate hundreds of kilometers, which is a long distance. However, there is another option for this population. It might also deepen. Um, so we understand that thermal gradients across depths are steeper than the latitudinal ones, because if this population needs to find its preferred climate across depths, it might need to deepen only tens to hundreds of meters. So it's a much shorter distance. And it's, uh, I didn't expand it, but it's also important to uh, know that those shallow waters are usually warm. And as we go deeper in the oceans, we encounter cooler environments. So I focus on the question, do species deepen to track climate? And while it sounds nice, we know that it's not that trivial because there are a lot of other variables that change with increasing depth. So for instance, you can see here in the northern coast of Israel how different habitats look at different depths. So this is about 8 meters and this is 150 meters. Here it's 70. Uh, so the first thing we can say that it gets dark, right? As we go deeper, it's a darker environment. Not every species can maintain its abundances or find prey or mates uh, in deeper depths. Um, the habitat looks different, look at the seabed, how they change, um, and other environmental conditions that change, such as the oxygen concentrations, uh, the barometric pressure, uh, and etc. So it's not that trivial. However, we do have some evidence for species that are deepening over time, for instance, in the North Sea. So Dolby et al. Uh, is also, uh, in this topic, quite a famous paper uh, uh, showing that across a time span of 25 years, a community of roughly 30 species on average have deepened. So 
what you can see here on the x axis the y axis are the species that were studied and on the x axis the change in depth this is the rate in meters per decade and all those points on the left side are for species that were deepening over time and if they had a significant deepening it will be a black point and only a few species had moved towards shallower environments so on average this community had deepened in a rate of 3.6 meter uh, meters per decade but what I try to focus on this chapter is not only the average depth. We were interested also in the entire depth distribution of species, understanding the patterns and not only uh, this effect size. So uh, we have here four different uh, predictions for how species might change their depth with increasingly warmer climate. What you'll see here on the y-axis are deeper depths as we go down and warmer climate as we move towards the right side of the plot. So the first prediction, is conservatism. What it means is that uh, the species do not change their minimum depths, this is what you can see here, nor their uh, maximum depths with increasingly warmer climate. So they conserve their depth range. It might be uh, related to species that don't really mind if it gets warmer, they can still maintain their population size. Um, in the second uh, prediction, we have a shift scenario in which species are deepening their shallow depth limits and both their uh, maximum depth limits. So this, is, this can be a classical case for species that track their climate uh, over time. And uh, the third option is a compression pattern in which species are deepening only their shallow depth limits and they conserve their maximum depth. So it could be related to uh, perhaps a strong change that there are in shallow environments or perhaps they don't have the ability to go any deeper in terms of ecological or physical barriers on the way. And lastly, uh, the opposite pattern is expansion in which they conserve the shallow depths but deepen their maximum depths. And this might actually uh, resemble those warm water species that have now more and more habitats available for them to use because it gets warmer. Now, in order to find uh, uh, the relative support for those different predictions, uh, we, used, we conducted a meta-analysis in the Mediterranean Sea. And it's a great case study because uh, the Mediterranean Sea has a natural warming gradient from northwest to southeast. So for instance, Israel is the warmest part uh, of the uh, Mediterranean. And so we have the environmental data. Today, it's relatively easy to get it. But what we need is the biological data. And to do that, we gathered uh, bottom troll data. Bottom troll data, for those who are not familiar with bottom trolling, uh, it's a vessel that drags a net on the seabed and collects whatever uh, individuals that are larger than the mesh size of the net. Uh, it could be fish, it could be invertebrates and the other species. Um, so eventually, uh, we have this data from every location uh, that you see here in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, overall, we had 236 species to work with, mostly fish species, but also crustaceans and cephalopods. And again, we have those uh, minimum and maximum depths per location. So now we have both the biological data and the environmental data, and we can try to understand how the depth distributions are changing with increasingly warmer climate. So what you can see in the plot above here on the y-axis is the minimum depth, and it gets deeper as we go down. And on the x-axis, you can see the sea surface temperature in the Mediterranean Sea. And what we found for this uh, uh, association was a significant negative one, meaning that with increasingly warmer climate in the Mediterranean Sea, species are deepening their shallow depth limits. However, when you observe the maximum depth against the bottom temperature, we don't find uh, any significant association. So once we combine those two results, we understand that we have some sort of compression pattern here across all species on average in the Mediterranean Sea. And it could be like many reasons why it makes sense. Uh, but one of them is that we know that in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the shallow waters are warming in higher rates compared to the deep waters. So you can see the longitudes on the X here in the Mediterranean and the bottom temperature on the Y axis. And you can see that there are higher slopes for shallow waters. As a next step, we wanted to understand how much can we generalize what we found? And we wanted to understand if some species might respond differently than others. So uh, the first thing we wanted to examine was the thermal preference of species. We know that some water are cold water species. They mostly occur uh, in cooler regions, while other species are warm water species. Uh, and we thought that they, we might see differences in their response. So the next analysis, you can see here again, the minimum depth, the, the one that was of interest. And the x-axis here, you can see the change in bottom temperature 
and we checked, uh, we tested the interaction between bottom temperature and thermal preference. And what we found here is that cold water species are deepening faster than warm water species. So there is a trade dependent response in this case. And the next trait we were interested in is the depth preference of species because, because some species are shallow water species and some are living in deep environments. So are the difference in the rates of deepening between those two? Uh, if we thought that uh, deepening deep water species uh, might be easier because the environmental might not change that a lot. It's already dark. So moving from dark to darker, there are things that change, but it's not like moving from shallow environments that have a lot of light and to entirely completely uh, round. Um, so again, we investigate the interaction between depth preference and bottom temperature. And we found that deep water species are deepening faster in this case. The last analysis I'd like to show in this chapter is uh, the comparison between depth generalists, those species that uh, live uh, across a wide range of depths, uh, against depth specialists, species that are moving in, uh, living in a shallow depth range. And uh, again, we found here a significant interaction that tells us that depth generalists are deepening faster than depth specialists, which might lead us to think that depth specialists might be unadapted to changing climate in terms of depth redistributions. Okay, so to conclude this chapter, we have a trait dependent depth compression. And what it can lead is to the biodiversity attrition of cold water species from shallow depths. And it might impact many of us, for instance, conservation efforts. So let's assume that the marine protected area is currently protecting 10 cold water species. It could be that already now or in the future, the next 10 years or so, those species won't be there, not due to fishing, but also due to climate change. It could be that those species are redistributing to new environments. So uh, we must also think about uh, the fact that marine protected areas should consider those changing in climate, perhaps connectivity and other means. And another thing is about fisheries, because if a fisherman is something after a cold water species, it might be that in the future, we need to go farther offshore to, deep, uh, to fish at deeper regions, and it will take more fuel, perhaps it won't be profitable. And not only that, the, those cold water species might be already vulnerable. So it might be important also to do some transitioning from cold water to warm water fisheries that perhaps are um, more preferable in these days. Okay, so we know that species are changing their distributions. They change their depth, uh, they're deepening. But what is the meaning of that? Are they deepening and they will persist? So it's fine, it's a good thing that they do that, or perhaps they deepen or, and it's an alert sign for us. If something bad is happening and they might not persist. And this is the, uh, the main goal of the second chapter. Um, so I go back to this slide here and you can see that this time we focus on the individuals. We try to understand what happens to uh, the, the population once it changes its distribution. And we also try to examine here the deep climatic refugia uh, posing, posing that uh, those uh, species that uh, are able to move deeper might avoid those adverse uh, warming effects and global change effects. So let's uh, assume we have a population of a species in the first time period, and then after a while, it deepened uh, a bit, and it could be two uh, different abundance outcomes here. The first one is that they will preserve their abundance, and it's a good sign. And the second option is that they de actually decline in abundances. Uh, and this is what we try to find out. So to do that, we focus uh, on the fish community of the Levantine Basin, specifically the Israeli coast. And I would like to emphasize that we have two different fish communities uh, these days. Uh, the first one is the indigenous species, and they are mostly Mediterranean and Atlantic originated. So individuals of, those, of this community in the Israeli coast will be in the warmest part of the range, okay? We call it the warm edge. However, uh, we also have the non-indigenous species arriving from the Red Sea with uh, Indo-Pacific origin mostly, uh, and they arrived in the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal, uh, and they transitioned from a tropical environment into a temperate environment. So they also encounter winters and higher latitudes. So uh, they are positioned now within their cold leading edge. And it's important because we think that those two communities might respond differently to warming. Okay, so uh, to have some information about those fish, uh, we use bottom troll uh, surveys that were conducted a, a bit before I was born. Um, so I didn't collect them, uh, this data, uh, from depths of 15 to 150 meters. 
And from each time the net, uh, the hole was dragged and went back to the vessel, there was a researcher there that identified the species and counted their numbers. He took a subsample from the hole, a fixed subsample. So we work with species ID and relative abundances. And this happened in two different time periods. The first one is the 1990 to 1994, in which I analyzed 138 holes. And the second time period, 2008 to 2012, in which I analyzed 163 holes. And it's important to say that within this time period, we have information saying that the, the Levantine basin, the Levantine surface waters, have rose by 2.5 degrees Celsius. This is unprecedented rate of forming. Uh, if we compare it to the global average, it's roughly 10 to 11 times than the global average, showing us that we are living indeed in a hotspot of climate change. So as a next step, we wanted to understand the central depth niches uh, of those uh, fish species at different uh, time periods. To do that, and also to account for different uh, sampling effort, we have logistic regression models that eventually uh, can allow us to achieve the central depth niche of species. What do I mean by saying a central depth niche? This is the range of values uh, in which the probability to occur the species are relatively high. Okay, I won't get into the details of the technique, but it, it will take a bit more time. These are called Hoff models for those who are interested. And then we extracted from the central depth niche the minimum uh, the shallow part and the deep part of this niche. So from now on, they will be called the minimum and maximum depths. And this is what we got. So on the X axis, we can see here the different fish species. Oh, oh, these are 64 species, 50 indigenous, 14 non-indigenous species. The Y axis is for depths. And what you can see, uh, those species are ordered from cold water species on the left, warm water species on the right. And, and those gray bars that you see are the central depth niche at the first time period. And all those colorful lines that you see are the central depth niches at the second time period. And they are blue for indigenous species and red for non-indigenous species. And one of the things that are uh, quite uh, prominent here is that every species has its own unique response. So we try to make some sense here and we have predefined patterns of how species might change their depth. So we can see that some species are conservative. They don't change too much their depth niches. Others are moving towards deeper waters. Some do the opposite, actually moving towards shallower regions. And some expand their depth distributions while others shrink it. So a lot is going on. And the next step was to uh, count all those different species and their patterns and try to understand what is happening across the entire community. This is what you can see here, those pie charts. So the indigenous and the non-indigenous communities. Um, and you can see the proportion of each pattern uh, within each community. And it's, it will be a lot to discuss, so I'll emphasize the main uh, things that we see here. First of all, most species uh, change their depths. So only a few are depth conservatives. A lot is going on here. And a minority of the indigenous species have actually marched towards deeper waters. So if I go back to the uh, diplomatic refugia and those species within their uh, warmest part of their range, we thought that this pattern would be more prominent. So it was a bit of a surprise to us. And lastly, we can see that half of the non-indigenous species we have data for have actually expanded their depth niches. And it also makes sense. Invasive species are really good with spreading. They do it also across the vertical uh, axis of the oceans. OK, so now we observe how uh, abundance changes correlate with those different depth change patterns. So this is the log abundance ratio. It's uh, the, sec the abundance in the second period divided by the first time period and log transform. So all those positive values that you see here are species that increased in abundance over time and negative values for those that decline. <coughs> when we ran our models, we found that depth change pattern had a significant effect on the changes in abundance. So again, you can see that there's a lot of things going on here, but I'd like to focus on the diplomatic refugia and especially this group here. So those species that are deepening both their shallow depth limits and their maximum depth limits on average, having the data we, we use, they're declining in abundance. So we don't have uh, support. The deepening is safeguarding from warming. We have the opposite. Those that are deepening decline in abundance. The last result I'd like to show you is again, adding the thermal preference because we understood from the first chapter the thermal preference has an important role in shaping depth distributions. 
Um, so the y-axis is the same as before, and the x-axis this time, this is the shallow part of the central depth niche, but it's the change in the, in the shallow part. So those negative values are for species that are deepening their shallow depth limits, and positive are for species that move the shallow depth limits towards uh, shallower regions. And we used an interaction with thermal preference. And what we found that we have a significant interaction. What it means here is that cold water species here in blue that are deepening their shallow depth limits are also declining in abundance. And warm water species that are deepening their shallow depth limits increase in abundance. So we have very different responses depending on the uh, species traits here on the thermal preference of species. And this is only the shallow depth limits. When we change the x axis to the deep border, the change in the deep uh, border of species, we don't find any significant interaction. So, what we learned from this uh, uh, result is that there are some interesting parts acting on the shallow depth limits, similar to what we've seen also in the first chapter. So, to conclude, again, we see the attrition of cold water species from shallow environments. Uh, it's kind of similar to what we see also in terrestrial environments across mountains. So in mountains, we have this also biodiversity attrition from the base of the mountains. And sometimes we also have extinction at the uh, mountain tops. Um, so there are some similarities with terrestrial environments, uh, but we see that deepening shallow edge individuals show the largest variability in abundance. And it may tell us that cold water species might be more vulnerable to warming. And we will see uh, the, the increasing expansion of warm water species. These are not you know, prediction to the future. This is analyzing data that was already collected. So these are changes that already happened. Okay, now I'll move to the third chapter, uh, titled Marine Fishes Experiencing High Velocity Rain Shifts May Not Be Climate Change Winners. So this is the spoiler. Um, and here I try to focus on the association between abundance changes and rain shift velocities and how fast species change their distributions. Um, and I'd like to give here, uh, to start with these interesting results by Hastings et al, uh, showing uh, here the uh, population level change in abundance, uh, different pop marine populations for the 300 marine species, different taxa. Um, so here it will be for uh, populations that increase in abundance, negative for those that decline. But now we have here the uh, location of the population with respect to its entire range. What do I mean, the spatial position? I'll give you a visual example. So we have here an example species, and this is its distribution. When we can calculate, we can estimate the central latitude of its range. And now all those populations that are positioned above will be called forward populations. And those populations will be equator populations because these face the equator and these face the pole. Um, and this is what you can see here on the x-axis. So zero is for equator populations and one is for forward populations. And what they found in this study was a positive association. I'm not sure if it surprised you. It says that equatorial populations decline in abundance, and it might be uh, it makes sense because they're already in the warm part of their edge, and if it gets warmer, they might exceed their limit and decline, and poor population increase. But what we try to account in this study is for the range shift velocities and what it means if you are fast or slow shifter. Because we know that there is a lot of variation. Some species don't move. Some are slow shifters. Some are fast shifters. And it could be that those slow shifters might decline in abundance over time because perhaps they cannot keep up with the basis of forming. On the other side, those warm water, uh, sorry, those fast shifters might actually increase in abundance, perhaps because they can keep up or preserve their abundances. And what will be the interaction with this spatial position? Does it matter if it's a forward or equatorial population? Do we have different responses? We have also specific uh, predictions for fast shifters. Uh, the first one regarding the abundance is that uh, it will be a shift advantageous. In this case, we'll see that fast shifters, uh, those, those fast uh, species can actually counter adverse climatic effects. And the next response could be on the other side is a shift and collapse. So we can also see species that are really fast, but actually then we see the decline in abundance. And it could be related to different mechanisms my part in this chapter is basically understanding the patterns, but for instance, instance different mutational load in the new region that they are arriving, or uh, such as extreme cold uh, events, cold uh, climatic variation in the new region that can go cause extirpations of new individuals, and etc. So, in order to have more precise predictions about how those three variables interact, 
uh, we I introduce here the Mark scenario uh, that I uh, learned from Lenoir, uh, a different researcher. Uh, what you can see here is uh, uh, the populations of the species, and it's a, lati it's a, a latitudinal range. And if you will see its abundance, it will be something like that. So most of the individuals are in the center. As we go towards the edges, we have a decline in abundances. This is according to the abundance center hypothesis, which is not always correct. Uh, but in some cases it is. But for us, it gives us uh, uh, easy simplification to start with. We also try different scenarios, but I, I won't show them uh, today because I don't have enough time for that. Um, and now we can see different range shift velocity. So in this case, it's a non-shifter. Here we have a slow shifter and a fast shifter. And now we can try to understand how abundances might change with respect to range shift velocities and in every location. So this is the border populations, centroid and equate board. And the last column here shows us uh, the association between population trends on the y-axis, which positive for increases, negative for decline. Uh, you got that. The x-axis will be the shift velocities. So towards the right, these are faster uh, species. Uh, and what we found here, what we found, what we think we will found here, sorry, is uh, that forward population should increase in abundance because these bands become wider, right? And center population should slightly decline. And we might see those equatorial populations drastically decline uh, and perhaps even extirpate if there are really fast shifters according to the Marx scenario. So in order to have some information on those predictions, we bind uh, global databases. The first database is called BioShifts, and it compiles uh, species uh, climate change induced rain shift uh, velocities of different species. The second database is called BioTime, and it uh, compiles different abundance time series uh, from different locations. So it's basically abundance regressed against uh, uh, time. And when we try to have some information on marine fish, after combining this data, we end up with 2,572 abundance time series from Biotime, belonging to 146 fish species overall. And this is how the populations are spread worldwide. So most of the data we have is coming from the North Atlantic Ocean, another portion from the Northeast Pacific, and some other uh, sporadic populations, such as in Oceania. Okay, now when we have this data, we can try to understand what is the association between the population trends uh, on the Y and the uh, shift velocity in the X. So shift velocity here, positive values are for species moving faster towards higher latitudes in kilometers per year, negative values for those doing the opposite, moving towards lower latitudes. Uh, on the Y axis is the uh, population trend, but this is the percent change in the population size after a fixed time uh, span of 10 years. So it's standardized. Zero will be for populations that did not change their abundance uh, over time. 100 for those, for instance, that doubled their size. Minus 100 for those that have no individuals left after a fixed uh, period of 10 years. And what we found in this case was a significant negative association, uh, which again, quite surprised us. We didn't thought we'll see this association and it is a sign for a shift and collapse. So if you are a fast shifter, you are predicted to decline in abundance. And these are examples of species that are really fast shifters. And if we, for example, see here the 99% of the shift velocity, those uh, species are about to lose 50% of their population uh, size. Um, so it's kind of a grim uh, result. Uh, the next step, of course, we're working with macroecological data, uh, large databases, a lot of variation in the data. We have to understand how strong is this pattern? Does it influence due to uh, uh, different variations in the data? So we used a lot of uh, sensitivity analysis and supporting analysis. Overall, we have 24 analysis in this uh, chapter, and all are uh, showing a consistent pattern. We try to remove the outliers. We have the special level analysis. We changed the weighting method of our models. We used only population trends with r squared values that are relatively high. We used some calculated population trends, scaled abundances. And we also controlled for the mismatches between biotime and bio shift because there could be some temporal and special mismatches between the two. We accounted for that and we still see the same trends. The last result I'd like to show here uh, is actually adding the uh, spatial position of populations. This index is a bit different. So 0.5 will be for the poor most populations. And, and these will be equatorial populations, zero for centroid. 
And this time population trend here, this is the slope. So those are positive slopes, negative slopes of abundance time series. And this is what we found. Uh, a significant interaction that tells us that for fast shifters, if you focus here on in this part of the plot, the equator populations are relatively stable and forward populations are those that decline. Uh, so we can understand if you go to our previous main result is that the negative association we found is primarily driven due to those forward populations. They seem to lead the pattern that we found, which was against our predictions. And so to conclude this chapter, we know that marine species are tracking climate much faster than terrestrial species. There are numerous evidence for that by now. In some instances, we're talking about six times faster on average. But I think the take home message from this chapter is that being fast, being a fast shifter does not imply that you're a climatic winner. If we see a species that is moving fast, we cannot be sure that it, it will increase in abundance or preserve its abundances. Uh, it's also important to account for that. And range shift velocities can also inform the conservation for local populations. So if we understand what is the spatial position of the populations we work with, we might understand what will be their abundance outcome. So in this case, forward populations require special attention. And, and now crossing all the chapters, the timing, oh, that was fast. <laughs> and so, um, we understand on the macroecological scale, on the Mediterranean scale, sorry, that changing climate shapes depth distributions, uh, not only the deepening of the average depth, but also the deepening of the shallow depth limits. Um, if you combine the, the first two chapters, we emphasize here that the shallow depth limits of species are important uh, indicators. Okay, we see both uh, the deepening of this region and both uh, the uh, changes in abundance. So we can see kind of uh, turnover in the composition of the community with uh, warm water species that increase and cold water species that seem to decline. Uh, and the last uh, remark here is that redistributions, the cooler environments does not inform us about persistence. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, before the questions, I'd like to move to some of my words of uh, gratitude to people that uh, I couldn't have done this uh, PhD uh, without them. And um, so, of course, I'd like to start uh, with uh, Yoni, uh, my advisor. Uh, the, one of the best things that I like uh, in the way that you uh, uh, supervise me along the way is that you gave me a lot of independence. I felt from the day one that was an independent researcher and that I had my... Uh, no free space to work with. And I think it developed me a lot. And I really like that. And in many cases, you pushed me out of my comfort zone. I, I remember one of our first meetings uh, in your office. I told you I wanted to be a lot underwater. This is what I want to do. And you told me, OK. Uh, but then you pushed me to do other stuff. Uh, and I think it developed me a lot. Uh, it was kind of a uh, process of, uh, no, I don't know, getting uh, mature. Uh, and also, uh, uh, it was a really dedicated uh, supervision. Every time, I know how busy you are, but every time you needed your help, uh, we could schedule. Mm -hmm. And you always had a creative uh, solutions. And of course, in those really difficult times for all of us, uh, a lot of empathy. And thank you very much for that. Also, when we transitioned uh, from a couple to a family and things are changing and you had a lot of empathy. And thank you very much for that. Uh, a huge thanks to Shahar uh, Malamud. Although I didn't present here my field work, uh, but I do work on uh, some chapters uh, related to field work. And the main thing he taught me is that everything is possible. <laughs> I had a dream, it can turn reality. If the boat doesn't walk in the middle of the sea, it's okay, we can solve it. If the whole layer stops working, no problem. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, my committee members, uh, Shai Meiri, Omri Bronstein, Menachem Goren, and Gitai Ayer. And I also have a special thanks for uh, Gitai, because it also gave me my first education as a, a, in my bachelor's. I have done a project uh, with you. And also you introduced me to Yoni. So without you, I didn't know Yoni in the right time, in the right place. So thank you for that, for this connection. And a large thanks to my collaborators along the way. And my project students uh, that they are not here, Shachal Dubiner, that helped a lot with the meta-analysis, uh, and uh, Guy De Bear, uh, which uh, unfortunately is currently now in Miluim. Um, and a huge thanks to uh, the Bellmaker Lab, 
for the entire uh, time span, uh, it changed a lot. There was a lot of turnover, but it was a good turnover. And I met amazing people throughout the entire uh, journey uh, that helped me uh, learn coding. I didn't know coding when I came to the lab. I learned it from everybody. Uh, they uh, had the good advice. We spent a lot of times underwater. It was amazing, uh, very good memories. Uh, thank you for that. And I have no doubt that this lab would continue to be a, an amazing place to, to do their research in. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, my family, uh, Komar, which is here. Thank you very much uh, for being my supportive backbone for the entire uh, 11 years. <laughs> Uh, it was really uh, important, and thank you for organizing today. Um, and Rani, which brings a lot of light to us, uh, she's one years old. Uh, my parents, Ilan and Adar, uh, for the support throughout the entire uh, journey. It was a great support. And my uh, mother and father-in-law, Gabi and Deran, that were really, really important in the last year since we had uh, uh, Rani, uh, allowed us to do uh, other stuff as well. So thank you very much. And now I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, it seems like one of the interesting variables would be climate adaptation and how well each species is able to adapt. Um, did you look at that at all? Is that something you um, I know that there is one index uh, for uh, like climatic vulnerability. But I still didn't use it. It was kind of new when I encountered it. It didn't come in the time for at least not for the first chapter. Uh, but I guess it's good to investigate it. I still didn't use uh, those kind of indices. I know one. Maybe some species that reproduce at faster rates are better adapted and yeah. smaller species. Maybe yes. Better. So for the third chapter, we also, uh, at the beginning, we also uh, use the different species traits, such as the body size or how fast they move. But it was, it's really interesting. I really want to get into this uh, information. It's uh, a lot of new work because species traits is huge realm. But it definitely has an interesting association. Yes. First of all, great talk, great work. I especially appreciate that the acknowledgement where we the picture of the vertebrae. I'm so and <laughs> it was random. <laughs> but my question, you had shown us lots of meta, but there were a couple of species that actually went into uh, instead of a cooler environment into the uh, uh, into warmer environment, or those who shifted towards shallower. These are the one I'm interested to learn about who they are, and if you can tell us something about why do they do. Yeah. So, in every case, not only in fishes, also in terrestrial environments and plants as well. We have evidence for species doing the opposite. And also there's a paper of that showing that there are some cases going like the opposite of what we think. Uh, so we do have these patterns that the I mean the the the, the disadvantage of working with microecological data is we, we cannot get into the mechanisms. We can only speculate, which is quite a bummer. Uh, because once we get to the discussion part, we, we have those different ideas, but for instance, in the second chapter, we have some species that are transitioned to shallower environments, some indigenous species, but some are also uh, uh, kind of uh, have a cosmopolitical distribution as well. And I think it might be related to the fact that there is a lot of new biomass in the new shallow environments, such as those non-indigenous species. It could be that they sort in for different prey and they also adapt to these uh, new conditions. Uh, however, we don't have evidence that the fact that we have this huge mass of uh, uh, non-indigenous species really changes uh, or impact the abundance of the indigenous ones. So it's kind of complicated, and I don't know what is the specific mechanism that causes this, uh, but it's really interesting to get into it for that. But you know which species they are. Um, yeah, in some cases I know. Uh, you have it on your figure, I so. Yes, yes, I know which the species are, and I know that in some cases they're related to kind of a, a, not the warmest part, but warm water species. So they're not extremely cold. We do see in the data that the, the most cold water species are deepening in that they get out of the data range that we have in this case, such as the bacala. 
that we see or organized purpose uh, scattered as targeting fish. Uh, okay. To follow Michal's question, first, I agree, great talk, wonderful. Second, invertebrates. You mentioned in your first chapter that you had also data on invertebrates. Yes. Can you correlate anything, or is the data enough to get any conclusions from what you have done with fish? Yes. So, first of all, the results have shown was the general one for the all species pool. And when I observed specifically all the, species, yeah, in the first chapter, it was all a species pool. So, okay. include all, both uh, cephalopods and crustaceans. And uh, then I also made a taxa level uh, analysis that I didn't uh, present here. Uh, Ta -da. <laughs> so this is one result. I have uh, a few more, but here you can see the depth range, uh, the effect size for up depth range changes with bottom temperature. And in this case, the effect size for all is that they shrink. We don't see like a specific response here. Uh, I also uh, compared, for instance, bone fi bony fish with uh, uh, with uh, elasmo branches. Uh, that they do seem to have some different patterns, but again, then my sample size gets a bit smaller. Uh, in this case, they all shrink their depth range eventually. Uh, 